everybody. Welcome to Atlanta. It's great to be here. Yeah, I haven't been here in a long time. And uh, I'm, I'm constantly impressed by what happened, what's happened to Atlanta over the last like 20 years. And I've been coming here kind of on and off. I think I shot a movie here, a TV movie here. I, I don't want to say how long ago. Okay, I'm keeping that close to the best. You guys know probably how old I am, but I'm not going to get into it at the moment. At any rate, it's a great town, I must say. It, 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 most of you folks from around here? Yeah. Yeah. Cool. cool. So, all right, we have some people that are going to ask some questions, but I kind of, before we get to our question, I have some of my own that I kind of want to talk about. I just, do you realize the, the cultural impact that you had with Jack Skellington? That it was such a, did you realize when you guys were doing the voice work for that, how profound, how long lasting that was going to last? Not a clue. No. I, I mean, I don't think, I mean, probably when you talk to any actor who's been in a movie that's popular, uh, if, if, you, if you ask them when they started rehearsals, if they rehearsed, um, if, you, if they started work on the movie, if, if it was going to be a, a, a sort of cultural touchstone and something that you know people watch forever and ever, uh, and they would probably tell you no, and I, that's my answer. Uh, I, I knew it was remarkable going in uh, to the to the actual performance, working with Henry Selleck, the director, um, but I had no idea that it would have this kind of afterlife. None. And, and pretty much the same thing with Princess Bride. Yeah. Same, same thing. You know, movies that started off okay. You know, Princess Bride did reasonably well when it came out. Uh, Nightmare Before Christmas did pretty well when it came out. But just the fact that they have not only endured, but that the people are, uh, you know, dedicate rooms in their homes to, to <laughs> right? Yeah. You, I'm sure if you don't, you know people who do. Uh, who at Halloween decorate their homes with Nightmare Before Christmas themes, uh, who, who, you know, dress up like Prince Humberly and Carrie Ellis and, you know, the Robin Wright, whatever. Uh, it is an, extra an extraordinary phenomenon, but it's also um, a testament to the fact that these are enduring works. They're, they're pieces that, uh, that have things about them that it, it makes sense that they lasted for a long time. Absolutely. When you were playing Prince Humbert, it seems that like you played it so, so straight, which made it even funnier when your lines were delivered. Like when you were when you were filming that, like how were you what were you trying to reach for? Because it wasn't like this comedic presence, but it was, it's just so funny. Well, I'll, t I'll tell you a story that kind of uh, speaks to what you just said, Chris. Uh, and that is comedy in general, if, if it's really good comedy, is serious business. And that is, the characters, and particularly with a movie like this, can broadcast to the audience, I'm being funny. Okay? And the story that is instructive of this is when I auditioned for Rob Reiner and William Goldman. William Goldman wrote the screenplay, uh, wrote the book, the original book for for uh, the Princess Bride. And I went to William Goldman's apartment in New York City, and Rob Reiner was there, and I walked in, and uh, I'm a big sports fan, right? And uh, uh, the New York Knicks, the basketball team, had just picked a guy that I was really upset about, right? I was just on fire, and I'd been reading about it on the way to the audition. And I made a mistake, but when I walked in the room, I said, they said, how are you? And I said, well, frankly, I'm really ticked off because the New York Knicks picked this guy, right? And Bill Goldman, William Goldman, it turns out, is a huge New York Knicks fan. He goes, went to the games, he's passed away recently. And he and I started talking about the New York Knicks, right? And we're, we're just talking, talking, and literally 10, 15 minutes later, Rob Reiner goes, excuse me, uh, I hope you don't mind if we do the actual uh, audition. And I said, well, of course, Rob, in a very good humored way, he was not being, uh, it wasn't being difficult. And I read the scene, and if you guys are familiar with the movie, there's a scene where Prince Humperdinck says to, to, to uh, uh, Princess Buttercup, uh, I, I hope you'll think of me as an alternative to suicide, right? And she says she's going to kill herself. And 
I played the scene totally straight. I looked at her and it was about, I want, I, because the idea is that Prince Humperty wants to accomplish something by telling her this. He wants to uh, persuade her to marry him. Right? He knows he's going to get her to marry him ultimately, but in the meantime, he's got a, he's got steps that he has to follow in order to to fulfill his nefarious plan, right? And so I'm absolutely straight. You know, I hope you'll consider me as an alternative. And Rob Reiner broke out in uproarious laughter. Okay, so right away that was a cue to me. This is serious stuff. The comedy is in the writing. It's not in the play, okay? Yeah. And that's very much the way I, we all approach the roles, which is everybody has stakes. You know, Manny Patinkin stakes where he's got to avenge his father, all right? Uh, uh, Count Rugen's uh, uh, stakes are he has, to, he has to perfect his torture machine, uh, and he needs subjects, right? Um, uh, Princess Buttercup, she has to find Wesley, and if she can't find Wesley, then she, then whatever is going to happen is going to happen. Um, everybody's got a, a, an objective that they have to fulfill and they have to play that objective, not thinking about comedy or the, the adventure or, you know, whatever the, the, the objective uh, ultimately is. And that's the secret to it. If you watch the great comedy shows on television, for instance, you know, shows like The Office and those shows, those people aren't playing funny. They're being those people in a very funny situation. That's the end of a lecture. <laughs> How many lectures? It's amazing. I love that when you do the line like Happy Mary and Put Down. It's so good. It's so funny. That's the writing. It's yeah. great writing. All right. Let's go to our first question over here. Hey, I'm super nervous. But um, you play in a ton of What's your name? Things. It's Autumn. Oh. And uh, I wanted to ask. What was it like working on Friday? Oh, uh, I think she's got a Friday night shirt on. <laughs> uh, fun, actually. Interesting that you would you wouldn't think that you know working on a movie that had very serious uh, uh, a cop, vampires and people dying, but it was a lot of fun. Uh, a lot of it was because the cast are they're all and they're still friends. We're all friends. We see each other whenever we can. If, if there's a, and all of us are there, we go out to dinner together. Uh, it's a real kind of, we, we bonded shooting the movie because they're all very smart people. They're all, particularly a couple of them, William Ragsdale is one of the funniest human beings alive. Um, Jonathan Stark came from improv, so he's a very funny guy. Amanda bursts the same thing. Uh, and Tom Holland, our director, and Ronnie McDowell, the uh, Rest his soul. Well, a wonderful person, and we just had a we had a wonderful time shooting the movie. Uh, the set was very lighthearted, uh, and at the same time collaborative, because Tom Holland, the director, used to be an actor. So Tom very much was into again. We're talking about you know characters' motivations and what they're after and what they're. And we had a rehearsal as well, uh, which is very rare for movies, particularly movies like this where we spent like a couple of three weeks of creating backstories for all our, our characters. Uh, and a lot of the stuff that ended up in the movie came out of conversations we had about the character's history. Uh, like, for instance, um, I kept doing, you know, how do you research vampire? Somebody who's been living for 400 years, we have to kind of look at the history of where this person, or you have to make up a history of where this person came from, right? Maybe he came from Eastern Europe somewhere, or most probably. Uh, but then I started researching, well, where else can I find? Let me look up bats. What are, what's the history of bats? What are they like? Because vampirism uh, essentially, supposedly, came from the original vampire bat, right? And I found out that 90% of the bats in the world are not vampire bats. They're fruit bats. So I asked Tom, I said, is it possible we can work fruit into the, maybe Jerry has some fruit, you know, some, some fruit bat in his DNA. Huh. And that's how the apple came to, to exist that Tom ended up using in the movie and that Jerry eats fruit all the time. So it, it was very cool and a, a, a really interesting way to work. 
Yeah, thank you. Well, I read about you were when you were in high school, I believe, or you were in a band. So oh yeah, the T tones or something. Yeah, yeah. And you, yeah you, 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 were, you were a drummer. You were yes, back up right. It was, and you actually went out and toured and performed. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. We were kind of the the well, if you want to call it the house band for part of West Virginia where I grew up. I grew up in southern West Virginia in a, in a coal mining town called Beck. And my dad was a Greek immigrant uh, who uh, ended up settling there just by chance. And uh, when I was, I was always, uh, I love music. And I was singing choirs in church and, uh, and, and I loved jazz when I was in my teens, or my early teens. And I decided I wanted to be a drummer. So I started taking drum lessons, and then I found some, there were some kids in my high school who were interested in playing rock and roll. And so we got together and started, you know, like most bands do, in somebody's basement, rehearsing. And whenever we had time, we'd get together and we'd play cover songs. We'd play Chuck Berry and the Beatles and, you know, whomever. Uh, not the Beatles, the Beatles were a little later, but uh, the Chuck Berry, Jerry Lee Lewis, and the, you know, the great, uh, rock, uh, uh, the great uh, R&B figures from the 50s, and uh, uh, Little Richard. And so we started playing just kind of locally, record hops and that kind of thing. And then uh, a couple of artists who came to Beckley, and we were the opening band. Uh, I forget the name of the first group who came, but then Bobby Darren came to West Virginia to play at a local high school, and we were his backup band. Uh, and uh, and then we got to tour. We went to Myrtle Beach and we went a couple of other places. And then we made a record, and uh, a lot of a couple of the guys ended up becoming full-time musicians. The guy, our lead guitarist, was a, a big session guitar player in Nashville for like 30, 40 years, for a long time. I took a different path, obviously, <laughs> uh, and ended up going to college because that's, you know, I, I just didn't see that this drumming was going to be my, my future. And then I discovered acting in college, so that was it. Excellent. Because uh, you, you, you had that performance in you, and so yeah, yeah, it's yeah, very, yeah, yeah. very similar. A lot of it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it just seems like though I could have made taking a small little deviation, you might have ended up being a musician and a successful career. Uh, who? Yeah, I mean, I'm sure you know, a lot of you out there, you know, you've been doing something for a while, and how it happened? How does this? How do these things happen? You know, it's it's fate, it's kismet, whatever you want to call it. Uh, I'm just lucky that I discovered something that was uh, a calling because. You can't do this job, and I'm not making it. I'm trying to. I'm, I'm not trying to romanticize it, but there's a lot of rejection in acting. You spent. <laughs> I'll tell you a story. Another story. Uh, my daughter uh, Alexis, who at the time was maybe like five years old, and uh, she and a friend of hers were at a pizza parlor or something, getting pizza or ice cream or whatever, and they were with their friend's mom, her friend's mom. And uh, they were talking about what their daddies did. And so uh, the woman asked her own daughter, she said, you know what your daddy does, don't you? And uh, her daughter said, yes, daddy makes wires in houses. And she says, that's right, daddy's an electrician. And she turned to my daughter and she said, you know what your daddy does, don't you? And she said, yeah, he looks for work. <laughs> well, that's what most actors are doing a lot of the time. You know, I belong to the Screen Actors Guild. Now it's Screen Actors Guild and another another union called AFTRA. And uh, at any one time, something like 90% of the members of the union are out of work. Because you're constantly going from job to job. You're not, you know, you don't have a profession where you go to an office and that's what you do. And it's hard to act by yourself. You know, you have to be hired to do it. Yeah. So, um, uh, and so it requires a certain kind of tunnel vision. This is what I have to do. I don't really have a choice. Uh, I think a lot of artists feel that way. Uh, that because, the, you know, the rewards are, uh, um, sometimes they're great. I've been really lucky in a lot of ways. Uh, and then, you know, you have a shelf life of a certain amount of time. Uh, now I'm, you know, older and the roles are not as frequent. But I get to do this. 
I get to hang out with you guys, which is great. I, I, this I really enjoy. It. Yeah. I said, all right, our next question right over here. Hey, Chris. Um, with all due respect to Tom Holland, um, was there ever a point during the filming of Child's Play where you were like, this is going to be a trash movie? Or did you just have a lot of faith in him the entire time? After having worked with Tom Holland on uh, A Fright Night, I had great faith in him to be able to pull it off because it was re Child's Play was really complicated. Uh, it, this was in a time when CGI was in its infancy and it was not really being used in Child's Play. But Child's Play was basically all the Chuckies were Practical. various iterations of um, um, uh, there were little people, there were children, uh, there were animatronic, you know, the robot, the robotic figures. There, uh, and to put all that together was, it required a, a singular vision, which Tom had, I think. And so uh, it, it was, and it was a hard shoot, too, because it was Chicago in the middle of the winter uh, at 10 below and wind off the lake, and we were shooting a lot outside. It was tough. And uh, he held it together and really pulled it off. I thought he pulled it off. Yeah, it was very good. It was. Yeah, thank you. I think we're, I believe you were invited to come back, but you weren't able to with your scheduling conflict for, I think, for the third one? Is that... No. No? Oh. No. No. I, I, I think we all, Tom felt similarly that I, I, if, if he was going to do another one, I was okay. But if he wasn't, then, and, and the, the, the sequels have all been great. I have no, you know, I'm not judgmental about it as much as the circumstances were just not right. Excellent. Yeah. Okay, excellent. All right, our next question. Hey, Chris, I'm Matthew. Hi. Uh, with having such a staple with Night Before Christmas and how much it has affected everyone around here, do you yourself see parts of Jack Skellington within you besides the skeleton itself? Uh, would you say the last part again? Uh, did you, do you see parts of Jack Skellington in yourself besides the skeleton, whether it be personality or, you oh. know, love or care or stuff like that? Well, I think with any animated character, um, particularly the way this movie was done, and most of them are done that way, I think, uh, and you'll see, for instance, that a lot of animated features now have stars playing those roles. Uh, they, the roles are tailored for the actor. Uh, particularly when they're big-named actors. Uh, because when you hear uh, Eddie Murphy in the, the Shrek movies, you, uh, immediately you have a, a, a connection uh, from all of the experiences you had with Eddie Murphy, but also, brilliantly, the animators tailor the, the figure to the person. Uh, and uh, you go into a studio uh, with, uh, with Nightmare, I, I worked over a period of two years, um, I'd go up every like two or three months. At the time I was living in Los Angeles and I would fly up to San Francisco where they were shooting and go into this kind of big building that they were using for a studio. And uh, there were storyboards all around the lobby um, and also punching bags and ping pong tables and you know things for the animators to use because it's so, it's such a, <laughs> <laughs> the, the only way to describe it is it would drive you mad and me mad to do it because it's literally a frame at a time. Mm -hmm. uh, there are 400 jack heads that they used in the movie, right? Different expressions or transitional expressions from, from a, 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 a plain face to a smile. Well, there's, when, we, when we smile, there's a transition that takes place in the musculature of our face. You can't do that in stop motion. You have to change the head every frame, right? Uh, so, this is a long-winded answer to your question. But, um, so, essentially, it was that they hear what they want to hear in the audition. Oh, this is the voice we want. And then you go in and you work with the director uh, repetitively over and over again, all right, let's do this scene and let's start with this line. You do that line and then the director says, uh, try it this way. Or he tells you exactly how he wants it to, to be said. Uh, and then maybe he'll say, okay, now try it three different ways, just go. 
And then he, the director who has the, the, the physical layout and the, and the scene in his head then chooses the take he wants and then he puts them all together and then he feeds that, the sound, to the, the dialogue, to the animators and he's supervising all this, right? And they create the scene. And literally they made something like 11 seconds of film, of actual, you know, narrative film a week on that movie. So it took two years. Yeah. And I, to a certain extent, I guess, you know, they didn't film me while I was doing the dialogue. They do that very often for animators where they'll, they'll shoot a video of the, of the actors in the studio uh, running the lines so that the animators have an idea of what the facial expressions are like, what have you. But with stop motion, it's very different uh, because there's no, f no physical flow to the actual stop motion. There is in the animation process of the, you know, visual animation. Is that a, that's a long answer to your question. Is that? Uh, good enough. <laughs> Thank you. They, 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 they can't, you. You can't help but have something from the, from the actor in, in the character. Yeah. Uh, I, it, but as far as I know, I, I, you know, it was not intentional on my part. I just went in and basically, I, this, was, this is my interpretation. Do with it what you will. Well, you did a fantastic job. <laughs> it's, a, it's a fantastic character, though. Uh, because I think that people identify with him so much because he's, he's looking for something. Yeah, He's exactly. looking for something. And I yeah. think that people can identify with that because it's, you know, we, even though we, sometimes you have what you think you want, you still like, I'm missing something in his life. And I think that was so well represented in the film. Well, and we all identify with that, right? I mean, we all have things in our life where we think, oh, wow, you know, my life is, this is my life. But what about what's out there? What about what they're doing? What about, you know, we all have that kind of sense of I'm not quite complete. There's something missing in my life. Um, and uh, that seems to be a chord that, you know, that's established itself as being the kind of the, the, the what, the theme, the leitmotif of the movie. Uh, and I, a lot of people who, who come up and say, and that's the other, the other thing to me too is, I have a, a lot of grandkids. I have nine grandchildren. And the, the younger ones get this movie right away. Like the two, three-year-old, four-year-olds are really into it. And part of that is the, the visual surprises. Also, there are surprises everywhere all the time, right? And then Danny Elfman's music, which is amazing, and his singing. Uh, and, and then as you get older, you start tapping into the, to the themes of the, of the picture, uh, uh, particularly for teenagers. A lot of teenagers come up to me and say, you know, this movie got me through uh, some tough times when I actually had somebody who came up to me once and said, this movie was my mother because my mother was a drug addict and she wasn't there. And so I, I, it gave me a sense of, of place and solace and uh, people that I could, uh, characters that I could go back to and, and that I was comfortable with and that I lived with. Um, that's not a small thing. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and by the way, I, uh, you know, we're talking about me here, but essentially for that movie, a lot of that was these amazing animators who, who put this thing together and the director. It's, uh, to me, an extraordinary achievement. It's wonderful. Now, let's kind of go back and rewind time a little bit. So you, said, you talked about how you went to college up in New York. Now we, no, I went to West Virginia University. Oh, sorry, actually. West Virginia. Yeah. When you were in college, well, I thought you got, didn't you get a part on a soap opera? Was that one of your first acting? That was my first job out of, uh, my first television job out of grad school. I worked in a regional theater in the theater for a couple of years. Uh, and then I moved to New York. Uh, and uh, within like uh, a month, I got a, a bit part on a soap opera. I was one of the, I, I was on a show called The Guiding Light. <laughs> and, right, and uh, uh, I was, <laughs> it, it, they're all doctor shows, or at least they were then, in the, in the late 60s and 70s. And I was one of the guys who, I, I was always scrubbing, 
when all the lead actors were walking through to go in to operate, I was going, you know, good morning, doctor. That was my line. And I made something like $275 a week. And that paid my rent. So I, it was, you know, found, it was um, amazing that, you know, the first thing that happened to me when I went to New York was I had a job that actually paid me to live there uh, at a time when it was a lot less expensive to live in New York. Uh, and then after I was on that show for like, I don't know, six months or so, I got a Broadway show, uh, a show called The Rothschilds. And that, I, I was out of town with that for a while, and then it came in and was on Broadway for a while. Uh, so I was really lucky starting out, because I know people, I have a friend, uh, I do a podcast uh, called Cooking by Heart. And it's on chrissarandon.com. And it's, uh, I have a lot of wonderful, interesting people on the show. And uh, one of them is a guy by the name of Michael Patrick King, who is one of the uh, showrunners for uh, Sex and the City. Uh, and Michael ran the show for a number of years and was the head writer and showrunner. Uh, and Michael came to New York when he was 21 years old and started baggage handling at Greyhound at the Port Authority bus terminal and then started working in a series of restaurants. He was 38 when he got his first writing job, legitimate writing job on television. He was there for something like 17 years. Yeah. I got to New York and I got a job right away. It's, uh, you know, I'm, thank you, you know, universe, God, whatever you think. But uh, I've been really fortunate in that regard. But most actors, look for work, as my daughter so, so brilliantly uh, <laughs> pointed out. When you were on set of The Princess Bride with Christopher Guest, I find that your guys' dynamic is so funny. Like we talked about, like, if you don't have your health, you don't have anything. Yeah. Did, did he ever crack you up? Was he able to ever crack you up? Because he's, he's, the way he delivers lines is, is hilarious. Chris Guest, whom you probably also know from his wonderful movies, his satiric movies, uh, Waiting for Guffman and uh, uh, Best in Show, those uh, they're amazing movies. Is he, first of all, he's a very dry sense of humor, uh, but he was. We spent a lot of time together because we were in a lot of scenes together, and we did a lot of writing. Believe it or not, because you don't see any of it on the screen, but we were out writing almost every day. And uh, he would come up with things in the car on the way to riding or on the way to set, things like, I know let, what let's do. Let's, let's make up limericks. Um, I'll do the first line and you do the second line. And well, you know, Christopher Guest. Uh, uh, getting to the set was a relief after <laughs> having been challenged by Chris Guest in the car uh, on the way uh, all the time. But he's a, a lovely human being, a, a very nice man, I interestingly. I know a lot of people hear that comics are not particularly uh, happy people, but he's a, a very nice man, lovely Excellent. guy. Excellent. All right, I have a question right over here. Hello, sir. My name is Liz. And earlier you mentioned Danny Elfman, who provided the singing voice for Jack Skellington, while you provided the speaking voice. And I was wondering how that process works from your point of view on keeping the character consistent across two performances in the same movie. Um, Danny had already done all of the songs and not only recorded them, but also had, they had animated them. So I had that as a template for myself. I didn't really change my voice so much as I think they were listening that when they auditioned for the speaking part. They were looking for a voice that was similar enough to his that it would transition easily from a song right into dialogue. Uh, and that's how it happened. I just went in and auditioned and uh, they liked the fact that my voice was close to Danny's, I guess. And I have a lot of people who say I, didn't, I had no idea that it was a different person doing them. I, I, I must admit to some jealousy at not being able to sing the songs, because I, I do sing, uh, and I've done like three Broadway musicals, but Danny's amazing, so I, I have no complaints. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs>
I didn't realize that the first several times I watched that film that it was that you two different people. Yeah. yeah, two different people. I had no idea. That's absolutely amazing. So with your varied career, do you have a preference like horror versus comedy? Do you or is it just all fun for you to, to act? In? I go back to my daughter about looking for work. It depends on what comes up. You know, very often you don't have a choice. There are very few actors who have their careers planned out over years in advance, uh, the big movie stars. I have been fortunate, actually, that I didn't have that kind of career because, uh, first of all, I didn't have to worry about my star dimming, as a lot of movie actors do. Uh, and also, um, it, it enabled me to make choices that were quite varied. I didn't have pressure from somebody saying to me, oh, you can't do that because this will spoil your public image. I didn't have a public image. I was, a, I, I was always I considered myself a character actor. And so whatever came along that was interesting to me, that's what I wanted to do if I got the job. Sometimes I auditioned and got them, like The Princess Bride and Nightmare Before Christmas, and sometimes I was offered things just straight out, like Fright Night, I was offered. Let's say, sent me the script and said, would you do this? Um, so it's just serendipitous, you know. It's, I'm, I'm again, I'm looking. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a lucky guy. It's, it's wonderful. And going back to like The Princess Bride, this, when it was being filmed, I mean, it seemed like it was something special, but like you talked about, it has transcended all this time. It is a movie that's going to be, still in 25 years, 30 years, it's still going to be relevant because people love the characters, they love the writing. When you were sitting there and going through that and reading that script the first time, did, they, did you realize that this was going to be, I mean, you were talking about how you don't really know, but did it feel special at the time? Oh, absolutely. First of all, the script was amazing. Uh, I had been a big fan of the book back when the book first came out, like, I don't know, 15, 20 years before. And it was, originally it was optioned by Robert Redford because he had done um, Butch Cassidy and Sundance Kid, which William Goldman wrote and won an Oscar for. And he, Robert Redford couldn't get it done. And uh, Goldman writes in his, he's written a couple of wonderful books. And in one of the books, he talks about the fact that when The Princess Bride was out there, it was known as one of those great scripts that's never been produced, that's never been actually made, that people loved. And that kept, they kept, kept going through different studio systems. It would go to a different studio, and the, the studio's director had green lit what they call, you know, this, I'm, I'm going to put money into this movie. And then he got fired. This happened to William Goldman like three or four times. So when finally Rob Reiner, uh, who was in love with the book, as I was originally, uh, got to it, uh, he uh, essentially went to William Goldman and said, I really want to make this movie, and I think I can get it made. And Norman Lear from All in the Family, the guy who wrote and produced All in the Family, as well as Sanford and Sons and any number of other shows, uh, Norman Lear put up all the money for the movie. There were not, you know, there wasn't a studio involved. Um, and so we all, everybody in the cast were fans of the, of the script, of the book and or the script. So the feeling going in, and also Rob Reiner is one of the most, he's, first of all, he's a great audience. So when you're working with him, you get a sense of wonder feedback all the time, whether it's positive or sometimes negative, but the negative is not, oh, that's terrible, let's do it again. It's just, oh, let's try this instead, okay? It's generally positive, positive all the time. And we also had a great experience doing it. We were in England together uh, at first on location uh, and a beautiful area. Uh, the restaurants were terrible where we were staying, so w Rob had a hibachi in his room, and we would go to his room at night, and he would grill hamburgers, and we would play games and hang out. I mean, it was just a, a lovely situation, actually working on the movie. Um, I would be walking, we, were, we worked in a, a castle called uh, Haddon Hall, 
which is where we shot the, most of the exterior locations of the castle, right, that was stormed. And uh, um, you would walk, you know, you'd be walking on your way to, to, to shoot a scene and you'd hear people singing and it was Mandy and Chris Guest and R R Rob singing doo-wop <laughs> in the halls of the castle where this, you know, they, it was kind of echoing like it is here. Um, uh, it was just, we just had a great, t great time shooting the movie. It was fun to do. We were laughing a lot. Um, uh, Mandy Patinkin talks about the fact that he spent how many m months, literally, rehearsing the fight scene with Carrie Elvis. Uh, and, and Carrie talks about this as well. And uh, no injuries, they never cut each other, they, nobody b b broke a bone or tore a muscle or whatever. And Mandy literally cracked a rib during the Miracle Max scene from trying to keep from laughing. <laughs> uh, so it was that kind of shoot, you know. And then we were in London for um, a month and a half uh, at Shepperton Studios and we all had, you know, I had my family there with me. And it was a great shoot. And, and I think that feeling of collaboration and uh, having a good time shows on the screen. Absolutely. Yeah. All right, we have a question right over there. I was wondering, a lot of actors will sometimes keep something. Can you, can you get a little closer Sorry. to the mic? I, I'm also older and hard of hearing. Sorry. Get closer so we can hear your question. Um, a lot of actors sometimes will keep something from the sets of the movies they worked on. Did you keep anything can from any of the movies? Did you keep any props from sets? Oh. Uh, so props from sets. Yes, I have uh, Prince Humperdinck's flag. Um, I have, um, I used to have some of Jerry Dandridge's clothes, but, uh, and I wore them actually out in the world, but uh, not that leather jacket because that's a little too much. <laughs> but um, some of the other stuff, the, some of the sweaters I, I had for a long time, but you know, it's a long time ago and clothes kind of wear out over time. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else. Oh, I have some of the Jack heads, the original Jack oh. Skellington heads. I have uh, one of the producers gave me four of the heads to keep. And I have Jack's blackboard where he was, you know, trying to figure out the formula for, it's a little careworn <laughs> from, from just from, you know, being on the set for so many years and then being in, I've moved a couple of times since I, I got it. Um, Trying to think if there's anything else. And I used to keep a lot of flags from things. I, I've done a couple of PBS things where I played Abraham Lincoln, if you can believe it. And I have a couple of the flags from there. Um, well, but that's pretty much it. Excellent. Yeah. Great. Our next question. Thank you. Hi. Hi, I'm Amanda. Um, I was wondering what it was like to work with Andre the Giant. Uh, Andre. <laughs> First of all, uh, all right, I, I have to tell my Andre story, okay? I will tell my Andre story, but first, you have to know that he was one of the loveliest human beings alive, a sweetheart of a guy. Um, uh, and when I was going to make the movie, uh, when I was leaving home, uh, my kids were very young. My daughters at the time were like three and a half and two. And uh, I said, look, I'm, I'm going away for a while because we were going to be on location and it was in a hotel and it was not a great place for kids. And um, uh, I, I'm, I'm going to be doing a movie with a princess and nothing. <laughs> the girls were not impressed, right? And I said, and then, and then there's some sword fighting, which they didn't care about. And then I said, and then there's a giant. And as soon as the word giant got out of my mouth, the, the, my daughter's going, you're working with a giant, Daddy? How big is the giant? Is he as big as a house? Is he as big as a car? Could he pick, a, pick you up with one hand? And so from then on, I was the guy who's working with Andre, right, to my daughters. And uh, during the whole time when I'd call home uh, from location, and I'd say, hi, Dad, it's Dad, I love you, what are you doing? Hi, Daddy, where's the giant? Is the giant big? Is he as big as a house? Is he as big as a car? Is he really, really big? Is he, is he nice? And so when they got off the plane to come and stay, uh, immediately, where's Andre? What's he doing? Is he as big as a house, big as a car? So I asked him if I could bring them to the set one day when I wasn't working and he was. And he said, yeah, sure, boss. Uh, called everybody boss. 
And uh, so one day they're doing the scene where uh, the brute squad is uh, rescuing, uh, uh, Andre is rescuing Indigo, right? Uh, and um, so we drove out to the, to the location and uh, my daughters are like literally quivering, waiting to meet Andre. And uh, we go to his trailer because he couldn't fit in the regular makeup trailer. He was just too big. He was, you know, seven, six, seven, seven, and 500 pounds. And um, so we go to his trailer and we walk in. I have to do this kind of. And so the trailer was like this, maybe like this size, right? And he's down at the end and he's sitting at his specially made table and chair. And I walk in, I'm holding one of my daughters and we walk in and Andre, is, who was sitting, stands up. And they start screaming, both of them. First, my, my daughter Stephanie starts screaming, then my daughter Alexa starts screaming, and now they're screaming together. And that, if those of you who have girls, children, little ones, right, that's kind of almost beyond the, the you can hear it, but it's like, I oh, my brain is going to explode. And I had, we had to leave. And I would take them back to the car, they're crying, they're screaming, they're... <laughs> so I go back to the car, and then I go back because I have to apologize to Andre. And I go to him and I say, Andre, I'm so sorry about this. And he goes, no, no, boss, don't worry. They either run to me or they run away from me. And that was Andre's life. He was the most attractive in terms of, not, not, I'm talking about beauty, I'm talking about attraction. People, Andre was like a magnet to people wherever he went, and he was kind and patient and dignified always, and a sweetheart of a guy. And he loved doing the movie because he said, with you, I'm not, uh, I'm not different. With you guys, I'm just one of the actors. He loved it, it was, it was great. He was a wonderful man. You guys, we've run out of time. Can you please give a huge round of applause for Chris? Thank you, everybody. This is Ross Marquand, and you are watching Fandom Spotlight, which is awesome. So like, share, and subscribe. Oh, and have fun, and follow your fandom.